Yeah, hey, hey, everyone. Oh, my slides are on? I'll be waiting just a little bit, yeah. I love coffee, though. Yeah, okay, everything is working. Okay. So what's up, everyone? You enjoy so far? Everything is fine? Oh. Nice. Yeah, so I hope yeah, that your caffeine level is where it should be. And uh, you're just about, yeah, you're ready to kickstart this amazing conference. And yeah, let's, let's have some fun, shall we? Okay, 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 tough crowd, yeah. Christoph, Christoph, it's a tough crowd. Okay, I'm really nervous to be here in front of you uh, because I'll be talking about a subject which is really close to my heart, and that's animations in React Native and animations in general. You see, I have applied with this talk because I see the struggle in this community, especially coming from newcomers uh, that would like to animate or get started with animations and learn something new and animate their static UI, but also from experienced developers. They lack and they don't know how to proceed and they don't know how to level up their skills. Um, so yeah, my, my goal, and by the end of this talk, uh, if you're a newcomer, you'll know how to animate your static UI. If you're an experienced animation developer, you can level up and look at things from different perspectives. We're engineers or self developers, and we don't think that we understand something unless we can build it. Uh, and this process, I like to call it learning by doing. It's, it's funny, though, because a while ago, I was doing a code application, and I came by this code from my friend Aristotle, and he's saying that for the things you have to learn before you can do them, you learn by doing them. You see, I'm a self taught developer, and definitely learning by doing is not a fun process. From time to time, you'll struggle quite a lot, and you like to give up and feel that you have this feeling that you know nothing about what you're doing, but it's okay. This itself is the learning process. There's a learning curve, but with incremental steps, you reach the peak. And that's because the best solution that you currently know is based on your existing knowledge. And for you to expand that knowledge and learn new ways of doing it, you need to learn by doing it. You see, reanimated, in my opinion, is going to empower you with amazing tools and capabilities so you can create delightful experiences really fast, easy, and performant. I believe that reanimated will open the gates for creating amazing animations, is going to eliminate a lot of roadblocks, and is going to solve 99% of the performance issues that you may encounter and instead, it's going to let you focus more on things that matters the most, and that's creating the illusion, illusions or delightful animations through micro-interactions and UI animations, and most importantly, increase the user experience. My name is Catalin Miron. I'm a developer currently helping others to succeed. If you'd like to find more about me, my work, and what I do, you can follow me on Twitter using Miron Catalin. I would like to start by setting up the ground and in what I'll, I would like to go through what I believe are the most important primitives which Reanimated 3 offers. The first and the most important one is the used shared value. Uh, shared values carry the data. It provides a way to react to changes and also drive animations. And the most import important thing, it's reactive. The data is stored on the UI thread but it's also accessible on the JavaScript side, hence the name, shared. It can be a number, it can be a Boolean, it can be a string, an object, an array. The second one is use derived value to create new values based on a shared value. In this case, I'm just adding 100 to an existing shared value wherever that shared value is changed. The next one is use anyway this style it's used when a style attribute will need to update based on a shared value. Or this style attribute depends on a shared value. In other words, it's a reactive style. In this case, the opacity is going to move or to change based on the shared value. Use animated probe is the counterpart of use animated style, but for non-style attributes. Like in this example, a stroke width or a path. Interpolate. 
is going to let you remap different values based on input range and output range. But of course, you can interpolate colors. In this example, instead of passing numbers as output, I'm passing colors. And interpolate color is smart enough to morph between those two, red and blue, in our example. Of course, you can animate those shared values using timing, using spring, using decay. You can delay the animations. You can repeat them. You can sequence them, or you can go crazy. You can repeat reverse a sequence of animations that have an initial delay. Mind blowing. You can, of course, listen to events. If you're using gesture handler, you can use, use animated gesture handler, and you have multiple listeners that you can listen to. In case of scroll, you can use animated scroll handler and have that event coming to you. And if you're only interested in the on scroll event, you can use the shorthand notation and directly get the event and modify a share value with it. Last but not the least, it's use animated reaction. It's useful if you'd like to set state or just react to changes on different shared values. Initially, you need to prepare. Basically, we will let to know the animated reaction, which shared value you're interested in, and then you can react to it, and you'll get the current value and also the previous and do whatever you'd like to do with it. Now that we have set up the ground for what I believe are the most important primitives, in my opinion, let's go to what matters the most when you'd like to animate stuff. And if you're getting started with or you're just experienced developer and just get everything up and running. So what matters, in my opinion, and the most important one is by far interpolate. Interpolate is, is going to remap your values based on an input range and output range. And you have endless possibilities if you know interpolate. Interpolate, how it's working, is going to, you need to pass a share value, you have an input range, output range, extrapolate left and extrapolate right. And in case those two extrapolations are equal, you can use the shorthand notation and pass directly the extrapolation. By default, the extrapolation is extend, and you'll see in a minute what extend actually means. Let me give you an example here. I have a component, I'm initializing the shared value starting from zero, and I'm animating this share value. You know, I'm repeating with an initial delay. I'm applying a sequence. I'm going to one with a duration of two seconds. I'm going back with a, with, again with a delay. And I'm repeating this infinitely with, in reverse. And now I'm using the use animated style, um, where I'm modifying the translate text using the interpolation. So I'm interpolating the xx value. I'm passing an input range of 0 and 1 and output range of 0 and 100. And finally, I'm applying this style to an animated view, which you should not forget about it, by the way. And this is how it's going to look like. As you can see from the screen, the share value is moving from 0 to 1, but the, the, the uh, interpolated value is moving from 0 to 100. You, you see, when, when, when I'm dealing with interpolations, I, I'm trying to visually represent them into my head uh, before writing the code. So I'm always thinking about a graph. And let me show you what that graph may look like for you. So the input range is basically a line with multiple values, in our example, 0 and 1. And the output range is going to be another line starting from 0 to 100. So in a nutshell, what we have written there is basically a graph with different values. So interpolate will try to estimate the numbers between those two ranges. But as I mentioned initially, the extrapolation is extend. So this extrapolation is what goes beyond that range. So you're interested in a single range, but the actual interpolation can, can happen outside of that range. So in this case, when the share value is going to be 2, the estimated value will be 200. And of course, you can clamp it. If you're not interested in the outside range, you just clamp it. So everything is going to happen only in that range. Or you can clamp it on the left and extend it on the right. Or you can clamp it on the right and extend it on the left. It really depends on your use cases. Another example which I find pretty confusing uh, is the index minus 1, index, and index plus 1 problem, which, yeah, I believe a lot of us will get it wrong, especially initially. Uh, so what is this all about? It's, it's all about animating 
items within a carousel, even though it's a horizontal or a vertical one. So let me give you an example here. I'm creating a horizontal flat list, and I'm rendering a carousel item, right? Nothing fancy here. And this is how it's going to look like. Each individual slide will have the size. It is going to be the screen width. So yeah, I'm just moving. Nothing It's animated, but uh, because of the paging enabled, uh, built in, in in any virtual list. Yeah, this is how it's going to look like. But now let's, let's take a look at how we can actually animate things inside it. So first, uh, in order to animate items inside the carousel, you need to have access to two different things. One is the index itself, and one is the position inside, or the scroll position inside that carousel, based on which you can do uh, many things, or fancy things, or you can go crazy. So first, initially, you'll, you'll have a share value for the scroll X in this case, because I'm using a horizontal list, and I'm using the use animated scroll handler to hook to this event, to the on-scroll event. Yeah, and I'm modifying the scroll X. Then I'm uh, modifying the flat list to be an animated flat list. Now I can pass the on-scroll event, and also pass the scroll X to each individual item, which is really important. Notice that there is a scroll handler, and I'm, I'm sick of repeating myself, but the 16 actually comes because of this math formula, right? You're one second divided by 16, it's equal to almost 60 FPS. So that's why it's 60. If you'd like to have it at 30 FPS, it's 32. That's why it's coming 16 there. So yeah, now nothing has changed visually, but we actually have access to the scroll X, basically the, um, where the scroll is positioned inside that flat list, and what we can do about it. As I mentioned, it's, you need to have access to the index and the scroll X. And based on which you can interpolate the scroll value, and based on an, an, an input range, you can, you can animate the, the views. And let's focus on this input range. It's index minus one, index, and index plus one. It's basically saying the range where this item can be visible. If you're swiping left or swiping right, even though it, you have the active item, it's, it, it's going to also uh, be visible outside of, of the active itself. So hence, hence the index minus one, index and index plus one. But let me show you what those numbers means. So the index, index minus one, it's the item that's coming from the right or it's going to the right. And the index plus one, it's the item that's going to the left or coming from the left. And the reason for that is because swiping left is going to increase the index. Swiping right is going to decrease the index. So it's exactly the opposite. So this was the part that most of us will get wrong initially. And of course, the index is the active carousel item. In this case, yeah, I'm applying uh, visually something. but. Um, Let's, since we are in reanimated world, we can apply math. And in this case, I'm just dividing the width, uh, uh, the content offset by the width. So I will clean up the entire code. So I will have index and index, index plus one. It's, yeah, nothing should change. But this time, as you can see on the scroll, you, you ac actually have directly the active index. So you can later use using use animated reaction to set state, trigger other things, I don't know, do whatever you like to do. Everything is already calculated. But you can go crazy. Of course, you're not limited to the only opacity. You can also translate things. In this case, I'm applying a different scale if the item is going either on the left or on the right-hand side. Or you can interpolate colors, why not? In this case, uh, if it's going uh, to the left, it's magenta. If it's going to the right, it's gold, otherwise it's white. And as you can see from the performance monitor, everything is running at 60 FPS or 120 FPS, depends on your device capabilities. Uh, but this wasn't possible using the animated API, but now it's possible and everything is running on the UI thread, which is really performant. The final, the final thing about interpolation, and I like to call it the interpolation exam, is when you know how to do sticky things, especially inside the scroll. So let me, let me actually showcase to you what I mean by sticky. There are three types of stickiness. Sticky after, it means that when the sticky element top edge, it's equal to the viewport top edge. The second one is sticky before, so it's sticky initially, but when the top edge of the sticky element is going to 
reach the top edge of the viewport, it's going to continue the movement, so it's not going to be sticky. You like the examples, right? And, and the final one is sticky bottom. So sticky by default to the bottom, and when the bottom edge of the sticky will reach the bottom edge of the viewport is going to move along with the scroll. So those are three different things. So let's create those. I have here an animated scroll view, nothing fancy. I have a non-scroll, I have a scroll event, and I'm setting the scroll Y because it's a vertical one. And I'm just rendering, oops, I'm just rendering a sticky element, I'm passing the scroll Y, otherwise it's just a dummy element, just for example purposes here. So let's take a look at the sticky element. I'm, I'm getting the Y value of that sticky element which I like to render, and I'm interpolating the scroll Y value, passing an input range, and I'm doing some calculations, kind of, where I, I, I inform the interpolation how it's going to look like. And it's basically saying when the top edge of the, <laughs> of, of the element is reaching the top edge of the viewport, I'm compensating the movement by one. Or in other words, just passing an input range and an output range, I'm basically specifying the range that I'm interested in, and the rest I'll leave in hands of the interpolate method to do the estimations of the values. Let me actually showcase to you in that graph. So I'm, I'm just specifying an input range that I'm interested in, and the rest is calculated by the interpolate. So that's why it's really important to master this piece, because based on which you can yeah, shape or shape the movement of the of the element or the movement itself. Another example, yeah, sticky before, so it's going to be sticky, so I'm compensating the initial, uh, the initial position by minus its Y position, and then when the top edge is reached, I'm just moving with the, with the scroll. It's important because I see a lot of confusion, confused faces here. It's important to know two different things. The item itself, it's actually moving with the scroll, so that's why I need to always compensate a Y position, so it's always moving. It's not a position absolute. It's always moving within the scroll. And the second part is actually to find where that item is going to be fully visible inside the viewport, because the scroll can be huge, but the viewport is just the height or uh, the height of the screen or maybe even smaller. So those are two different important things. And again, this is the, this is the graph, how I imagine when doing this thing. Um, I, I, I'm applying there a minus one just because you, you can uh, pull to refresh or the scroll Y can go below zero. So I would like to keep it sticky as well in that, in that particular case. So as you can see, I'm just defining a range and interpolate is going to do the math for me. Again, this is sticky bottom. Sticky bottom is almost the same thing, but this time the only, the only trick is to calculate the initial position of the element so I'm adding the minus y value because I would like to be at the top. Then I'm compensating with the scroll height or the viewport height, and now the top edge is going to be at the bottom edge of the viewport, and then I'm adding the height to make it visible. I'm uh, subtracting the height to make it always visible. And notice that I'm, as I mentioned previously, since the element is always moving the scroll, I'm also compensating with the scroll. So I'm calculating the position, I'm applying the scroll as well, and now it's just a matter of finding the sweet spot where everything is going to uh, be visible on the screen. So it's saying be sticky until this item is fully visible on the screen. Another topic is fluidity, and applying those natural movements, I think it's, it's really important. And in this case, I'll be using math. And William is here in the audience, so you can also discuss with him and why math is really important. But since uh, we reanimated to expose a lot of great techniques, you can also use math. So let me give you an example here. The, the math formula that I'll be using is arctangent. It's basically saying, give me the angle between two different coordinates. And let me showcase to you. Uh, I have here a random ball that's moving. I have a ball that's randomly moving on the screen, and I have some arrows that are pointing to that, uh, to that ball. So let's dissect this animation. Again, the, the arrow itself is going to receive the XY coordinates of the ball, and it's also going to create its own XY coordinates using the own layout. And I'm applying a style, in this case, a rotation. And this rotation is actually coming from this formula. So let's, let's take a look at how this formula may, may work like. Initially, I'm, I'm subtracting the arrow Y and ball Y, and 
arrow x and ball x. So in this way, I get the angle in radians, and I'm transforming them into degrees because I don't like radians. And I'm adding 90 degrees. And the reason for adding 90 degrees is because the arrows initially are vertical positioned, and I like to have them horizontal because, yeah, using math and trigonometry usually is good to start from zero. Um, so yeah, in this way, yeah, I'm just animating things. And just notice and bear in mind that there are 220 different arrows that are pointing to this ball. And everything is running at 60 FPS. And doing the math is roughly around 14,000 calculations per second. And it's still running at 60 FPS, which is mind-blowing. And I think that's why it made reanimated. It. it is the most, and by far the most performant and nicer library to use. So thanks, Software Mention, for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another example, it's, it's so funny. I, I've created this almost two years ago, and since then I have never seen anyone that was doing the same way I was doing it, uh, just applying like natural behaviors, behavior in physics. And instead, they, they just hard code the angle of the balloon, which is not good. So let, let's dissect and, and see how we can apply this math formula. So you see, I'm receiving the x coordinate of the knob itself, nothing fancy, which is a shared value, not an animated one, but a shared value, pure value. And I'm deriving based using this, the same formula, but notice this time I'm just hard coding the indicator height because this will be fixed all over the place. So it doesn't matter the exposition is going to be on the same thing. But we're looking at this and nothing is going to work. And the reason for that is the x value. x value is instantaneous. It's coming from the gesture handler and it's instantaneous. So how we can actually apply a natural delay to everything? Well, you can use spring. You can derive a springy value. And instead of using the x value, we can delay it using natural behaviors and physics and calculate the new angle based on the springy value and, of course, use it for the translate x. And a quick tip here, if you're doing a lot of calculations, just move everything into a derived value. Um, and otherwise, you'll end up maybe with sluggish animations. And especially if you'd like to reuse the logic, in, in this case, for rotation and the translate x, yeah, just please move it into a derived value. Um, and yeah, this is how it's going to look like. As you can see, it's like a lot. Yeah, just a couple of lines of code. It's incredible what you can do with math. The same example, uh, I, I was blown away by this community when I released this tweet. And uh, yeah, you, again, each letter is aware of the null position and is calculating using math. Uh, it seems fancy, but it's not. Uh, it, it's not. There are like 100 lines of code, including the mock data. The next thing is about layout animations. And Reanimated 2 and Reanimated 3, uh, recently announced, uh, comes with layout animations. And there are two things that you can do in layout animations. Mounting and unmounting of the components. Basically, each animated view will have an entering and exiting prop. Uh, that's basically an animation. And most importantly, Reanimated comes with 78 pre-built animations, uh, like fade in, zoom in bounce out, you name it. And each individual animation, uh, you can apply a different modifier to it, like a duration, duration with other modifier, like delay. You can random the delay, you can springify, you can springify with mass and stiffness. So let me give you an example. Here I'm mounting and I'm mounting, and I'm applying a fade in with fade out, or a zoom in with zoom out, or slide in left with slide out right, and yeah, go crazy about it. Uh, so, as you can see, there are endless possibilities for creating really nice animations, especially just by, yeah, the, the API is really simple, and having those pre-built animations is going, to be, is going to make your life even easier. So, definitely check it out. Just to give you an example, like a real-life example, I have recreated this piece by Dre, and I'm just using layout animation for the headphones and for the text and whatever. Yeah. Uh, Reanimated tool uh, did everything for me, basically. The last thing is layout animations, and you have the layout prop uh, that you can pass. And I think the, the most important part, which I believe about layout animations, of course, Reanimated tool will try to calculate the layout, the size, and the position. 
But what I find it really nice is the reparenting, the shared element value or the hero animation. This is working only when two different elements will share the same key and they are under the same parent. And mounting or uh, yeah, flipping between those two because they share the same key and you pass the layout. Reanimated tool will try to match geometry if you are, if you are familiar with iOS. And yeah, in this way, it's, it's going to morph between those two different values, which, yeah, it's, it's mind-blowing once again, and you can do a lot of cool things with it. And of course, as I mentioned for the animations, you can apply the same modifiers to it. In this case, I'm just Springify, and you can also interrupt the animation. Finally, I'll give you some tips. During my React Native animation development, uh, yeah, I came up with some. And the most important one, use interpolation when you can. Um, yeah, in this case, uh, instead of doing this, uh, applying a shared value for each individual style attribute, just use interpolate and the output, map it to your needs. Uh, the, the other one uh, is use layout hook. Uh, so yeah, this is a method, it's initializing the X, Y, and yeah, the layout itself. It's also exposing the on layout, it's modifying something, and yeah, it's returning the measurements plus the on layout, and how you can use it as any other hook. The cell renderer component, and I'm pretty sure that most of you here wanted to get the own layout from a render item. And um, I mean, the size is good, but the position is wrong. It's always zero. And the reason for that is because each individual render item is wrapped into a cell view, which is, uh, this means that instead of getting the own lay layout from the render item, you need it to get it from the cell. So in this way, now you get the Y value properly displayed. In this case, it's Y, but the same will apply for the horizontal. And how you can extend that? Well, because you like to have access to those measurements inside render item. So in order to do that, you just modify the child and pass the measurements. I'm here using the use layout hook again. I'm passing the measurements. And now, suddenly, I have access to the measurements inside render item. So moving to the render item and combining this with an animated flat list where I'm passing also the scroll Y, as I mentioned previously, um, you'll have access to the index measurements and the scroll. And based on that, you basically have endless possibilities that you can animate. Let me give you an example here. I have a, a render item that's actually dynamic. Uh, it, it has a dynamic height. I'm calculating everything. And as you can see, I like to apply a, a scale when the top edge is reaching the top edge of the screen. And bear in mind that each item has a dynamic height. Um, finally, about Moti. Moti is a tiny yet powerful library uh, for React Native powered by Reanimated 2. And it's going to help you animate styles, properties, really, really simple, and it's the most powerful tool for creating micro-interactions. You just need to pass the, the set of initial styles and the set of uh, styles that you like to animate. In this case, I'm, I like to animate from opacity 0 to opacity, opacity 1, and of course, it has layout support, and you just need to pass the set of exit styles. Um, yeah, pretty cool. Uh, of course, you can animate based on React state. In this case, opacity if it's opened or not. And again, the transition is going to happen underneath, uh, so you don't have to deal with things. But you can alter that transition, and you can specify as a spring, as a timing. You can pass a different duration, a different delay. You can repeat. You can repeat in reverse. You can loop. You can, again, uh, do color uh, transformations, in this case, from gold to purple. And Moti is smart enough to figure that you're dealing with colors, it's going to deal with colors, it's going to interpolate those. But you can go crazy again, add multiple styles, and Moti will, will match each individual style and is going to perform that transition. And finally, you can sequence them. Uh, yeah, in this case, I'm translating from 0 to 150, 150, 0, and again, it's going to apply the same transition, which is pretty cool. I'm a huge fan of Moti, and I have built tons of examples, and here on, on this slide, I'm just showing you the power of Moti. I'm using low, I'm creating loaders, I'm using micro-interactions, I'm using U, it for UI animations. I'm, yeah, I'm just creating that user experience, uh, which a lot of users would like to see, uh, especially in, inside a mobile application. If you like to have access to 
the examples that I have showcased during this talk and to more than 70 other examples uh, where I'm taking uh, math, or animated API as well, reanimated, gesture handlers, math, and many, many others and solutions to problems which I've encountered during my React Native development time, uh, consider becoming a Patreon using the, the link uh, from above. And Everything that's good that's happened to me in my life came because of that. I might not do everything great in my life, but I'm good at this. And I want to share this with you. I want to teach you what I've learned. I get to touch people's lives with what I do. And it keeps me going and I love it. And I think if you give it a shot, you might love it too. You might love it too.